<laughs> oh, classic. <laughs> wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I noticed you got long eyelashes, eh? Yeah, my girlfriend says that about me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've been, here, I've been told that actually about a lot of people. I got I got long eyelashes. It's, no, the truth is Caucasia, the, the, the area of the caucus, yeah. only, yeah. only encompasses a certain area of the world. And guess what countries those are? Iran. 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 <laughs> Middle East. <laughs> Iran, Russia, right. Turkey, and the country of Georgia. Jo oh, Georgia. Wow. Oh, right. Really? Wow. Interesting. Yes. Just that little area is the caucus. Nowhere else. Interesting. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah. look who I can see right now. There we go. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> so so last thing. Yeah, you're welcome. Last thing, guys. Let me give you my gift. My last gift for you guys. Oh, yeah. Thank Let's you. Let's go ahead. <laughs> There we go. This is my last gift, everybody. I get, I get. This is two gifts for the ridiculous yeah, we're, in podcast. Man, we're sorted, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh. All right. Thanks for having me on the show. Today's good. I'll give a specific shout out to Craig Haywood. This was a great show. You had me share my heart and soul. I have to give it to my bro Gareth Martin. From UK to Australia, down to USA and South Africa, you both get the picture like a camera. I recommend you listen to the Ridiculously Human podcast where they have the best guest in. Oh, man. I had the last part. But I'm going <laughs> to I recommend you listen to the Ridiculous, Ridiculously Human podcast where they have the best guest in. I want to say Gareth and Craig make the best friendships. Uh, Woo. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> I love it, man. That was awesome, buddy. Woo. High five, buddy. <laughs> Freaking legend. Yeah, buddy. what a legend. <laughs> you got the skills here, my man. Thanks for writing those for us. That's yeah, freaking that's awesome. Yeah, cool, man. We really, yeah, that's really cool of you, bud. Kind of, those are two great kids, man. Thank you. <laughs> you see, you're the kind of guy that gives back, and, and we appreciate that. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, definitely, bud. Appreciate it. Thank you, let's guys. Hope, let's hope it. your interview doesn't break my computer again, because that's what <laughs> I'm <laughs> 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 how's it going, Gareth? Hey, Craig, guys. How's it going, my man? Yes, man. I'm uh, very awesome, my man. How about you? Yeah, but I'm really awesome as well, man. Thanks for asking. I'm really excited about our chat today as well. We speak, we're speaking to an amazing guy, Tony Mosey. Uh, Tony is the son of an African mom from Sudan and the son of a Latino dad from Dominican Republic. Tony's overarching offering is being an edutainer. He basically fuses education and entertainment. Tony is also a United States Army veteran and social worker. Tony has the longest eyelashes you've ever seen <laughs> and will make every girl jealous too. <laughs> Today, Tony fuses his passions of books, acting, and music to make rhyming book reviews. And we covered some really cool topics in the conversation too. Hey, Craig. We did, hey Gareth. Um, we discussed uh, our gifts which he gave us, which were special wraps that he made for the two of us, which was really awesome. We discussed how he's always been into reading and read a whole bunch of books as a kid. We also go into the confusing and tough times that a child goes through during a divorce, which was really tough on him. He also is enamored with his mother, who's very entrepreneurial and really inspired him throughout his life. And she's an amazing woman by all accounts. We also get into some of the tough sides of his youth. He was bullied and, in his own words, treated like Forrest Gump on the bus. And he also felt that the only way that he could bolster his self-esteem and become a stronger youngster was to join a gang uh, on the streets of Yonkers in New York. Um, discussing the streets that he was living on, he also noticed a lot of mental health issues and substance abuse and he feels that the root of that is poverty and people having having to actually really worry about where they find their next meal we also get into not having a father figure and how that can affect a young man and his self-esteem and later on he gets into the army and becomes a driver in iraq and some of the harrowing stories uh, and moments he encounters there. 
he also is a rapper and he's made lots of friends uh, in places all around the world and he's traveled because of his rapping skills and that's really a fun part of our chat. Uh, we also get into how he got back onto the straight and narrow through meditation and reading, which is really interesting. Tony is seriously passionate and we discuss why people follow other people that are so passionate and why people get inspired by that kind of passion that they see in others. And he also gets on to uh, all about his rhyming book reviews, which is his real passion these days. Hey, Gareth. Yes, Craig. And uh, we just got a little bit of housekeeping as well. Firstly, we just want to say that we are massively grateful for the feedback we've been receiving from you guys. And we recently sent out an email asking for feedback on our podcast to help us bring more value and to help us structure it a little bit differently going forward. And we just want to say thank you to you for giving us that feedback. If you do have any more, please send it through. We listen to everything. We really want to bring you guys as much value as we can from our podcast. And I think now is a good time for us to hear what it's like for Tony Mosey to be ridiculously human. Hello, Tony Mosey, our main man. Thank you for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. How's it going, my man? How are you doing? Oh, man, I am so happy to be with you guys here today because you guys are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> likewise, <laughs> buddy, likewise. <laughs> Thank you for your energy and positivity, man. <laughs> Even through some scarf troubles, he's still got a <laughs> smile on his face. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, life is good. Life is good, man. I'm thankful. I'm here with the ridiculous, ridiculously humans, and we're yeah. about to do a wonderful podcast, and I'm so thankful. Awesome, buddy. Yeah. Well, well, like, let's just uh, let the listeners know that this is actually round two. We had a major technical default, and um, uh, Craig's computer flip and just did not open one day and uh, yeah. lost everything we basically had which is such a shame um, but the cool thing is is we you accept, you said yes and we're doing round two so thank you for your understanding brother we know that your time is like you know uh, very very you know of the essence basically so we appreciate you giving us more of it but yes yeah well thank you once again uh well, um here's a question here i'm gonna break through uh random but serious question to me. I was cleaning my toilet today and I was wondering, <laughs> I was wondering, why do they make this big cleaner for such a small little area of the bathroom? I mean, I'm in there <laughs> with this big cleaner putting it around this, the, the insides of a toilet, toilet bowl and I'm wondering why, why can't I just sort to just a spray that's like for the whole bathroom? So I don't know, just, that's a question to me, like why did they decide, you know, the cleaning companies to make this huge cleaner for such a tiny little thing, like cleaning toilets? Uh, <laughs> what sort of it's, cleaner? What are you talking about? Sorry. So it was a toilet bowl cleaner. I think, uh, I don't know if it was Arm & Hammer. I don't even remember, but you know, nevertheless, I hate clean, having to clean the bathroom. <laughs> and I give it to anybody who has to clean bathrooms, you know. Oh man, 100%. And, uh, yeah. Exactly. So I'm cleaning my bathroom today. I'm cleaning my toilet and I'm just like, why do I have this one thing that only works for this one small area when I could be using the spray that's used for everything? Everything. Like, yeah. It's because it's all about the sales, man, isn't it? Like you've got, I, an, ex you've got an extra thing that you got to buy. <laughs> exactly. I was just thinking about that. Automatically, I was thinking of the business idea and I was like, okay, these guys obviously are smart. I mean, everybody felt, <laughs> you know, fell for it. You know, they're like, well, I got to keep my toilet bowl clean. And I was thinking maybe they posed this whole scientific like thing to sell you on it. Like, well, most of the bacteria that comes from the bathroom comes from your <laughs> toilet bowl. And so therefore you need to use this specific cleaner that cleans it because it kills off all the other dirt and dust and disease. <laughs> that other places do not have. I don't know, just crazy. Well, that, that was a, it, it yeah. worked on you because if you remember the, the tagline, yeah. Right? <laughs> but are you trying to sell us something on the show? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Tony Moses toilet bowl cleaner. <laughs> Buy it soon. Uh, classic man. Cool. Well, anyway, Tony, how's your day going, bud? You full of energy? You had a good day so far? Yes, you know, uh, guys, you know, I know you guys, uh, especially. Uh, uh, I, I keep mixing if it's Garrett. 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 Yeah. No, no, I'm saying, but I'm just saying, I don't know if it's between Gareth or Craig, but one of your brandings, even though both of you guys are ridiculously human, but you have your sub brands, <laughs> and I see more of the person who who uh, who um, 
who promotes the health and oh, welfare. That's me. Yeah, yes. probably. Oh, I don't know. I mean, we both we both do it, but <laughs> both, are, both are healthy individuals, nevertheless. I'm just saying, like, of course, for my seeing it on your email, you know, your email icon and all these other things, that I'm just like, okay, I see this one more as the like in your face like pro like you know nutrition and all that stuff like that uh, it's, it's probably me it's, it's probably me annoying you but that's probably it <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, and that's good because you know that always inspires me because you know like lately i've been trying to do a thing uh i was i was linking up with a, a md he's a big md at the uh, mayo clinic in arizona He's uh, an obesity expert. His name is Dr. James Levine. He's from the UK as well. And he wrote this book called Get Up. I did a rhyming book review for him. I did like, you know, a rhyming yeah. book promotional for him. And it basically talks about how, you know, like the, the number one cause of obesity is because people are not getting up more often. People are sitting down. He says because the, the chair, you know what I'm saying? He says like, especially if you're not, especially if you're eating a lot of food, especially a lot of high caloric food, the chair is what contributes to the ABCs of medical issues. Mm -hmm. So he, so the thing he always encouraged in his book and, his, and further reinforced in the interview was that as soon as you finish eating some food, doesn't matter even whether it's healthy, low caloric or high caloric and unhealthy, just get up because his uh, get up and walk for 15 minutes, like seriously, at a, at a pace of 1.5. And I don't know the conversions in <laughs> metrics or whatever like that, but 1.5 miles per hour, which is equivalent to the traditional zombie, like very slow. <laughs> and he noticed when you whenever, you know, he noticed when he had the two uh, experimental groups, the ones where he made them be sedentary versus the ones who he made uh, walk for 15 minutes that given like six months later, the ones who were sedentary, Sedentary were already experiencing like you know like uh, uh, you know like issues of uh, diabetes, mm, uh, high yeah. blood pressure, yeah, like high blood pressure, all these other things versus the people who just simply got up and walked after eating yeah. like two to four thousand calories of like junk food. So, <laughs> it, so I just make it a thing, and I've always done this for the past few years, but like lately. I've been loving it more because the sun is out here in Boston. I live in Boston yeah. and I take a walk on the beach and I walk for about an hour at least in the beginning yeah, right. of the day and then another hour at the end of the day. And I get, uh, you know, I get my 10,000 to 20,000 steps in a day. Cool, man. That's awesome, right. buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, it's, it's, it's I think a, walking yeah. is highly underrated. Like people don't realize that that's all it is. It's not like it doesn't have to be rocket science or some crazy hit workout. Just, yeah. just walk more, you know, it's, it's incredible pretty it's it's that it's that easy but you know what i noticed too once again we were talking earlier before we got on air about how humans are i never i, I try to be smarter enough and say it's not by race it's not by gender i mean i you know i guess perhaps we could talk slightly about that but i believe personally it just comes down to this one thing humans are humans and if you look at the bell curve distribution of things many humans fall within the average category many humans are average and uh, you know, there could be the type of person who are just complacent and cool with being average. And there's the other ones who want to be more than above average. But nevertheless, a lot of people fall on the average. And it takes that one. It takes that person to be like, look, I am better than this. I know I can think better than this to transcend past that low level thinking. So like, you know, we're just thinking about that, like the things that are the most easiest people forget, they overlook. That's yeah. another that's another crazy cognitive bias that the fact that it's so easy that they're just like, I don't know if this works. I'm going to go feel like I, I need to go do like 45 minutes to three hours in the gym of <laughs> intensive workout. It's like three hours. Why? Wow. True, buddy. True. Yeah. It, it's amazing. It's amazing how like simple you actually, you know, you can keep it to be healthy, you know, like drink mm. more water, sleep better and go for a walk a few times, you know, like twice a day or something like that. And then <laughs> that'll cover like most of it pretty much. Yes. Yeah. And off the back of that information, there's actually other research. This is like a lot of people, that's exactly what you said, Tony, is like people want to sit all day long. And then at the end of the day, they want to do like a major three hour workout. But the reality is that doesn't actually, mm -hmm. it doesn't negate the day of sitting. It's, it's basically, you just have to do a little bit of walking throughout your day is actually better than like a three hour massive workout after a day of sitting. So we just got to keep things simple. Hey, like keep yeah. the average. We're all average. Just stick to the average and you'll be all right. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, like obviously there's a lot of things to speak about within that. Like, you know, like 
Yes, I like how you brought that. Like, you know, I was saying how a lot of humans are average. I mean, like, that could be a whole, like, conversation about, like, who yeah. wants to be above average? Who wants to just be complacent? You know, versus, like, just doing what it is uh, that has been going on for thousands and thousands of years, which is basically the average of time of what the average people did. But, yeah, I agree. Like, you know, simply just walking. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking already back to the ancient Roman times, you know, where, <laughs> you know, that's all they did was walk to go deliver things or to go walk to go grab like fetch water or mm -hmm. food yeah. or, you know what i'm saying or like l talk to somebody or meet maybe a potential mate a girlfriend or, or wife yeah. like we <laughs> they walked and like i don't know like running i mean running is good i believe in running you know? <laughs> like you, no no I, I think running is great but obviously like i ran short distance i ran track and field and i don't know of course there's a school of thought they talk about anything well, okay, let's go back to the phrase. Anything in moderation, right? Everything should be done in moderation. Right. Do you agree or disagree? Pretty much. Okay, because in I'm general, just... general, yeah. Because I'm just thinking about this. Like, I feel those who've done things in extreme for a long time, for, like, long periods of time, like, like chronic stuff, like, anything that you do that's extreme for long periods of time is detrimental. That's mm. what I believe. So, like, you know, you think about, like... What about pro uh, rugby or uh, NFL or soccer athletes? I mean, say they were play hard, hardcore from the age of 12 all the way to, well, you know, they stop normally around like 30s. But just could you yeah. imagine a person enduring that all the way till they're about 50? You know, like just yeah. could you imagine like what kind of complications they're going to have with their joints and their bones and their everything else? So it's yeah. like that's extreme. I mean, I think those are yeah. extreme sports. Like, you yeah. know, you're. You're hitting people, you're running hard, you're running a lot, you're lifting, like, all this stuff. Like, it's like, I think, like, if you can just be active, but just do something moderately, like, you're, you're fine. And I'm talking to people who are 60 versus people who are 20. Like, I think just being like, you know, get up, you know, at least try to get up once, once a day, you know, try to incorporate a, a little bit of fruits and vegetables, eat some water, just like you both said, like, just a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Is, yeah. People feel like they have to go extreme. So, anyways. Yeah. Well, yeah. Craig, Craig is very knowledgeable in this, uh, like, abundance well, life, life field life, because uh, yeah he's a doctor and this is like half of what he practices well, uh, right, well you 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 know just what a combo you've got all you've done so much stuff Gareth, with your chef course and your nutritional courses and i mean seriously like and, and at the end of the day both of what gareth and i often talk about is exactly what you say tony is just like keep it simple go back to basics hey okay gareth totally bad totally yeah. yeah so so anyway tony before we kick off buddy we understand that you have two presents for us and you're going to give us one now and one later am i right yes so everyone who's <laughs> listening everyone who's listening listen up because this is a gift for the ridiculously human podcast which not only means gareth and craig also means you who are listening all right so check it out here's my first gift right here it's in rhyme form I'm always into this music. I'm being intervived by ridiculously human. Gareth and Craig about to interview me. Your friend Tony Mosey. Yes, yours truly. Two South African men who make spectacular friends. The podcast season is the reason why I'm rapping for them. Oh, I love it. That is looking cool, man. Thank you so much, but that's really thoughtful of you, but it was awesome. <laughs> But that's okay. that's power, man. We you well, of course, you know the the um, rhyming book reviewer. Hey, like what a what a legend! And uh, thank you so much, as you said, for for joining us and part of what um, being ridiculously human is. And coming on the podcast is telling us uh, your story. And uh, you certainly have had a very interesting life, but and you um, you know you've you've done quite a few different things in your life, and we'd. You know, we'd love to know sort of, you know, the, the sort of beginning of that and you growing up um, as a young kid in uh, New York. So if you just want to take us along there yeah. and let us yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I love you guys once again because you guys like the way the way we had it, you know, the, the way you guys always have it for every one of your podcasts is you, you have this platform that gives this vibe that's very open and embracing and just pretty much allows the individual to have the floor to speak his or her own mind with uh like unconditionally like to be able to just have that uh i don't know i forget to say that uh, acceptance unconditionally for that person about their trials tribulations the realities the things that have occurred in their past and that's great i think like every podcast person needs to have that but you guys have that 
Thank you, my Thank man. You, man. That's yeah. really cool. That's well, well, we, yeah. It's, it's definitely the truth. You speak the truth. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So you know, yeah. we, like, we know we like to hear the rawness, and uh, yeah. you know, let's let's take it back. So, okay, my name is Tony Mosey. Um, real name is Anthony Scott Palmosey. See, here the rhymes, all these rhymes are happening. These rhymes <laughs> off the mind one time. You know, every line unsigned. But uh, so uh, how I came up with this idea of being an edutainer, an education, uh, an edu and entertainer, an entertainer <laughs> meets educator. Well, I mean, it started off basically going way back, okay? Because what I do right now in the sliver of edutainment at this moment is I do uh, musical theatrical book promotion. So I promote an author's book in a musical and theatrical way. What I've specifically honed down, so you see the edutainment idea, and I go into book pr books, and then I go into uh, this other niche that's more j uh, genre is hip-hop. I do it in a hip hop theatrical way, almost like a uh, what, what's the name, the opera guy Hamilton would. Uh, so that's the niche that I have. But where I come from and I, how it's transcended into this point, I went to a performing arts elementary school. My mom was very uh, much of an uh, ad addict for education. My mom came from Sudan, Africa. My dad came from the Dominican Republic. So my dad's Latino, Hispanic, speaking Spanish. My mom's from uh, Sudan, and especially the part that she was from not only spoke uh, Arabic, hmm. but spoke French. So hmm. here's the Arab, French, Latino, all this mixture that makes this chocolate sexy guy over here today. <laughs> With long eyelashes. <laughs> yes, long eyelashes, which once again, I talked to my uh, Irani, my Iranian uh, significant other, and we were talking about like how where she came from and how she has the the features that she has to today. And it had me thinking. I was thinking, man, I come from a background, of course, where I needed the eyelashes because of the certain terrain with the uh, perhaps it was a, very dusty and windy, and I needed those eyelashes to protect my eyeballs. <laughs> but today, it's something that women and you know other people. People wish could they could have because it's like it's a, it's a status of sex. It's a sex symbol. Like the fact that I have these long, long eyelashes, women have always told me, females have always told me since high school, like, my God, I love your lashes. So, anyway, <laughs> I don't fear it off. But, you know, see, like, I'm just, I could just think of all these things. I love, I, I love, I love, I love. Edu entertainment, but I love education. I love always feeding my minds. I, I love, I always like to say my tagline, read the lines so you can feed your mind because I love just reading and That's learning cool. about stuff to feed my mind. Nice. Um, but yes, going back, um, you know, so I went to a performing arts elementary school. I learned how to play alto saxophone. I was singing in the choir. Uh, you know, there they teach you how to dance and do visual arts, but I had two really strong suits, and that was playing in a concert and marching band with the, as an alto saxophonist and uh, acting in the drama troops. Um, I acted in the drama troops. Um, I learned how to do things, you know, play in scenes like The King and I, The Sound of Music, a few other things, a lot of the monologues and all that stuff like that. And I still continually to uh, dabble in, in, in plays and theater and stuff like that still to this day. Uh, I, I, my parents divorced when I was nine years old. That was a very pivotal moment of my time because so much things were happening. Nine years old was the time where I discovered playing alto saxophone. Uh, and I was getting really good at that. Uh, I was also on the drama troops. My mom put me in a summer book reading contest where I read 14 books at the age of nine in one summer. Wow. And then my parents divorced later on that year. So the divorce, reading all these books, discovering an instrument that I fell in love with. But then, of course, I left it somewhere as a, you know, an irresponsible child would normally do. I left it one day because I wanted to go grab pizza and I was hungry after school. I left the, uh, the pizza shop, come back, and my saxophone was gone. So, uh -huh. uh, you know. My teacher was angry with me. He didn't want to see my face. So we took a year off, and then I came back sixth grade and then, you know, continued playing until the end of high school. Um, my parents divorced, lived with my dad till I was 12. I was born in New York, uh, born in Brooklyn, raised in Yonkers, New York, near the Bron Yonkers, Bronx area. Uh, it was really tough. It was a tough time in my life uh, because of the divorce. And when I started getting into junior high school, I was getting hormones in me. I hated my dad at the time because my dad was just never around. He used to leave me in the house for at least eight hours a day. 
Like I was basically in this one bedroom apartment. I think it was about maybe 400 square feet, tiny uh, apartment as a, you know, nine through 12, just there all day watching TV, reading books, listening to music. But then eventually my hormones started kicking and I wanted to explore my dad, you know, just was never, just never around. He was, uh, you know, my mom was the smart one out of the two. And I'm not dissing my father today, but what was happening then, it got me to mm. understand. But my my dad was very reckless. Uh, my mom was more of the shrewd, prudent, you know, uh, you know, like the, she was the visionary of the two. She started four companies with my dad. Actually, uh, the first one was a nail salon and uh, also a housekeeping business. And then the third one, um, well, yeah, there was nail salon, housekeeping business. Uh, I forgot. Oh, she she used to rent ice cream trucks in the summer to sell ice cream. Uh, and then also she um, had our, our our pest control company, which was called A and R Budget Pest Control. Anthony, myself, and Ray, my dad, Budget Pest Control. And we were running these operations out of our apartment, but like still, nevertheless, we were living in a very impoverished uh, situation. I'm surprised that you know. I think you know because of my mom. And, you know, the fact that she was savvy, she was savvy enough at that time to at least get us to have our bills paid and get food on the table and allow us to, like, you know, take vacations once in a while. But we're still living in this situation. And I think it was because my mom knew her worth eventually. She started finally seeing in herself, like, I'm better than this current circumstance I'm in. And so I want to get out of it. And, you know, I can't blame her to, at, at this moment. I can't blame her today. I, I blame, I was mad and angry when I was nine because I had no clue what was going on. Like, how dare you just leave, you know, both of us and whatever, you know. But now I see what she's, what, she, what her rhyme and reason for that. And at that time, it was tough because I was living with my dad. He wasn't there. And I was roaming around the streets. And look, when you live in this area, Yonkers, New York, you're worrying about stabbings, you know, uh, shootings. You know, people are getting killed, ha- homicide, uh, gang, gang activity, a lot of heavy gang activity, heroin, uh, heroin, crack, all these types of substance abuse. I mean, a lot of people, man, I don't know. It reminds me of this guy named Necro, uh, his rap, rap, a Jewish rapper from Brooklyn. He goes... Most of New York is filled with mental patients, some trying to be mental and some others being mental patients. I don't know <laughs> why that stuck with me, but I just thought it not only was the way he made that line out, but when I was in that area, it just seemed like a lot of people were fucking dealing with a lot of substance abuse and psychiatric issues. Because, I mean, think about it, a lot of correlations between people who live in uh, poverty versus people who are affluent, there are more mental health issues on the former versus the latter. There's mm. more health issues with those who are in poverty because they're worrying about they're going to get not only the, if they're going to be able to live in their apartment or they're going to be homeless but if they're going to have something to eat today mm. you know? and then um, on top of that I have to worry if they're going to get shot or killed if they're going to be caught in a crossfire shooting so that eventually became my burden too once I started going into junior high school I went to John Burroughs Junior High School in Yonkers, New York uh, at that time I, I think they were just getting ready to implement um What's that called? Uh, uh, gu- um, metal detectors because yeah. kids at the mm. age of 12 and 13 were bringing knives and guns, Crazy. drugs, and you had to worry about gangs. And I, I was worried. I couldn't even I couldn't even concentrate. I mean, I could not concentrate because kids were always, you know, they were picking on me. They were, you know, jumping me always in groups. Uh, I mean, I would try to be in class trying to concentrate and kids would always try to throw big things at me, kick me, you know. I, I the one I remember the one thing that was always vividly was when I would get picked up uh, by the, you know, the school bus and I would go into the bus and I'd be treated like Forrest Gump, like the movie Forrest Gump. I would get into the bus and just when I want to make a seat, I want to sit down, a kid would move over and be like, sorry, there's no, wow. there's no there's no room here, and then I move to the next one. They're like, they're like, oh, no, man. you're not sitting here. But but well, Tony, why, why, like, why was this happening? Why were they treating you like that? I, I can only I can only imagine. I still still I, and I can still see to this day, and I could may even conclude that the fact that I I I couldn't stand up for myself. I didn't know how to. And at that time, my excuse was I didn't have a father figure to help me with that. I didn't have uh, uh, I didn't have anybody or a mentorship to tell me this is what you do in certain situations. I didn't know how to react. I'm I'm this you know this guy from nine to twelve living with my dad. Well, I was living with him, but that didn't necessarily mean I had a relationship with him. And I didn't know how to defend myself. I didn't know how to speak. I didn't know how to do certain things. You know, I didn't know how to take care of myself. And nevertheless, I'm still a minor. 
But, you know, kids are kids are picking on me because they're like, we know that he's not going to do anything. He doesn't know how to defend himself. I mean, obviously, they didn't, I don't think kids got into that trajectory and saying, well, he doesn't know how to defend himself because he didn't have a father figure. But more the more the effect that they see that every time they did the demeanor, yeah, yeah. there was no reinforcement back to them that said, look, I'm standing up for myself. I don't care who you are. So I didn't do that. You know, so I didn't stand up for myself. Right. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about that. Junior high school was really, really tough. And then I was roaming around the streets late at night, sometimes two or four in the morning, because I was mm. really tired of being around my dad. I was like, my dad, you know, he's like, oh, before you go out, let me check your homework. And he would give me my homework. And, and, you know, I would give him my homework, and I'd put, like, sometimes two plus two equals six. And he's just doing it just to go through the motions. I think he was also dealing with his own issues, because what I found out, too, was that my parent, my dad was pining over his divorce because my mom came in and out like that she just said look i'm tired of what's been going on and i saw it from when i was six all the way till i was nine what was going on between both of them but it got to that point you know where my mom hit my mom's boiling point and my mom just said I- i'm leaving i'm sorry i just can't do this anymore with you because my dad was very you know he's very I don't want to say because he's Latino, but people have said to me, which has whispered this idea in my ear that, you know, Latino men are just very machismo. Okay, whatever. But nevertheless, as an individual, let's not even use categorizations of uh, of, of races and ethnicities. But nevertheless, my dad, he was very uh, loud and ostentatious and, you know, all this stuff like that, that it got to the point it was really annoying. And I see and I see why my mom was like, look, I can't deal with this anymore. I'm living in this kind of environment. I'm not meant to this. My mother also had two college degrees. I mean, my mom, you mm-hmm. know, had her first bachelor's degree, then she got her second bachelor's degree. And then also she's building businesses, even though they're small time. She's 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 using her brain. She's using it much so much to her benefit. And this is the thing I say to people. And I said this also on one recording that I had. That how do you have two people? You know, we live in this world where we want to say, you know, light pe- light skinned people have it better than dark skinned people. But I'm looking at two of my parents. My dad is a light skinned Latino man, light skinned Latino man, and my mom looks like me. And mm-hmm. tell me why, still to this day, my mom is reaping so much great benefits. My mom travels around the world. She's built some some businesses. She makes money. You know what I'm saying? Like she's invested. Like she does some great things. But meanwhile, my, we, meanwhile, unfortunately, and I believe I'm gonna be the one to pioneer for my dad. You know, but my dad still to this point still lives in this whole victim mentality of saying, you know, because I'm Hispanic and, you know, because mm-hmm. I live in this situation, not, things are not going to go well for me. You know, it's never going to go well. And and lo and behold, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So, yeah. like, I'm thinking about both my parents and seeing their just their situation and it gives me so much of a broader understanding of why – They did what my mom did, what she did and why my dad had the reaction of what he had and where they are today, you know, based on their mindset. You know, Mm -hmm. you know, vicariously, I've learned that through my mom about the whole mindset thing, like your mindset really creates everything. My mom always knew her worth. And that's the reason why she was able to be like, you know, I'm going to charge people like people want to use this for mine. People want to come here and do this. Well, they're going to have to pay X, Y, Z stuff. And at first I was always used to be like, why, mom? Why, why, why are you doing things? Why are you saying these things? She goes, think about it because blah, 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 blah. I have to do this. I have to get this. I have to ask for this. They're going to also be using this and depleting that. So I have to also get this. And I'm just like, wow, my mom knew her worth. And that's the reason why she is of worth. And I want to say to anybody who's listening, when you, once you know your worth, like it would exemplify, you know, indirectly or directly that aura will show to people that you are worth and you are to be taken seriously so i'm just saying like i'm seeing both my parents and all that stuff like that and what happened but like here i am moving in finally i'm roaming around the streets 12 years old people are spreading rumors you know of course around this time i don't know how dcf or department of child and families and social services was back back in these times but um i'm walking around i'm wearing a white shirt it has dirt stains, food stains that's ripped, torn because, you know, here I am trying to dodge neighborhoods because I want to get out. I'm tired of being cooped up in this place, in this one little apartment as this 12-year-old, but I also want to get out and explore. Here's my mind trying to go and trying to figure out and learn things. And, of course, during those times, once in a while, you know, I don't know if it's once a week. I felt like maybe it was at least once a week. I would encounter these troublesome situations, you know, like I remember walking with my mom one time and we're walking through these, uh, the projects, you know, uh, uh, low, in- low income housing. And uh, this one kid had a, a big dog with him 
And unfortunately, it was a pit bull. I love pit bulls, but unfortunately, it was at that time, it was a pit bull. This kid, he was about the same age as me, and a pit bull was barking angrily. Aah! And then he's like, he's like, I'm going to let this dog out on you. I'm going to let this, this dog, like, run after you. And I was like, oh, my God. And so because... Because of the fact, I don't know, this kid is in trouble. You know, a lot of these, a lot of the kids from these situations, just like myself, we're coming from parentless, for the most part, we're coming from parentless situations. You know what I'm saying? Like, when you have a person who doesn't have a good father figure, more important, like a boy who doesn't have a good father figure, if you don't have, you know, a boy who doesn't have a good mother figure, nevertheless, like, when you start seeing one or both of that uh, that dynamic happening, like you're you're reckless, so you're seeking other things. So it got to a point, Gareth and Craig, it got to a point because I had no father figure, I had no mentor, that I started seeking mentors elsewhere, and not necessarily the best way. I was looking mm. for, I was looking to get into gangs. I was gonna be this your stereotype, your statistic. I was gonna be this Afro Afro Latino or African American Latino American kid who was going to get caught up within gangs, caught up in being in prison or incarcerated or dead or on drugs or all of them or all of them. And yeah. I was destined for that because at that point I was tired of kids jumping me. I didn't have any like mentorship, and I'm like looking around. And I'm going, you know what? I, I you know what? I need protection. I'm tired of these kids freaking coming up to me, using me, and I need protection because kids was now starting to come in droves, uh, troves, droves. They're coming in yeah. groups, you know, and, and to, you know, they're like, let's just make a mockery of him. I don't know if they used me as a way to be like, let's promote our game by showing that we can like beat up anybody at will if they mess with us. I don't know, but nevertheless, it started becoming into groups of kids starting to jump me. And so I wanted to jump really quickly into a gang. And I knew what that was going to head me into because gangs normally ends up into you having to go beat someone to death, uh, shoot or stab someone to death, uh, perhaps even take certain drugs that you don't want to take, uh, and then more likely being dead or in prison. So that was my trajectory. Fortunately, that stopped when my mom heard about the stories and saw what was going on. What I said to you guys during the last time we had our interview was what makes my mom so much different was in this regard. When they got divorced, normally women ask for child support and alimony. The judge said, hey, we are going to uh, put your ex-husband in prison because he has not play paid child support. Uh, and he refuses to pay child support. Um, and, and I forgot what else was there. But those two reasons, because the fact that he failed to pay child support and he didn't want to pay alimony, they were going to put him in jail. And they even asked. They said, you know, we can do that. And guess what she said? She said, no. She goes, don't put him in prison. It's OK. I'm fine. And I will pay him child support. Jeez. What yeah, a that's an amazing woman. Yeah. But Tony, so just you know, briefly before you just move on there, like, I'd like to just understand a little bit more about, you know, being this vulnerable kid. I mean, obviously, you you wanting to fit in and be more um, liked and be protected. The ga You spoke about gangs and, and sort of um, these kind of groups. What, what is the scenario like? Do you, are you very, at that stage, are you very well aware that there are groups that you can specifically go to? Or is it just kind of like you just get groomed or how do people get into that, that sort of gang? What is the process that happens? Um, so at that time when I was about, you know, when I was 12, right. And, and probably shortly right before that, I just, it, it's, uh, it's hard to say. Like first I start off with the feeling it's in the air. It's around. You hear about kids talking about uh, the yellow color gang, the yellow color Latin king, like the Latin kings. You hear about it, like kind of like maybe a whisper or saying, oh, my brother, you know, even kids saying my brother's in it or, you know, my brother's friend is in it and he can use we can use him to help protect us. I don't know. Like, you know, but it, it's it's kind of whiffed in my ear mm -hmm. here and there. Uh, and um you know, so I didn't. It didn't really concretely hit me at that time. It did. I mean, it didn't really like legitimately hit me at that time. I just knew that these existed. I knew that they're like even certain. They were even gangs of certain um, what you call it, streets. Like you go to certain blocks, uh, a gang will control that one block, versus gangs who control the whole. Well, nevertheless, if they're if they're say a quote unquote Latin kings, Latin kings can go anywhere beyond new york they go into you know connecticut they go into mm. new jersey so but nevertheless yeah like as for me like it was 
it was I was slowly being groomed into it, and I knew it. It was vicariously through through the kids that you know, because at nine it was cool. Nine and ten was cool. I was hanging out with kids. Uh, I had friends then. Uh, about eleven and twelve, I started getting with like I hung out with these two like uh, kids, you know, once in a while. But like it was getting really tough to the point like I was like, man, I have like little to no friends. And uh, and of course, here I am getting into my own trouble that the parents are like, we don't want you hanging out with this kid. This is the bad kid we don't want you to hang out with because I was reckless and angry. I had a full of um, uh, hostility and anger. You know, my parents divorced and all that stuff like that. And I'm just thinking about that. And I'm just, um, you know, like how much of an effect, how much of an effect it had on me and this kind of demeanor that I carried, especially with my dad being so agitated and also pining and sad and de- grieving through his whole, you know, divorce and all that stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, I got to that point where I was like, you know what, like, I know eventually I am going to want to be in a gang. I know I'm going to want to because these 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 kids beating me up, you know, these kids picking on me, it's starting to get it's starting to get tiring. I'm starting to get, you know, real I can't I can't concentrate. Like and I'm tired of showing these kids that I'm weak. You know, like I would fight back, of course. There would be times I would fight back, but I would still get my ass jumped. You know, so I didn't know how to fight. I didn't know how to you know, prepare or arm myself. I didn't know how to even speak uh, to a way that I could subdue someone. I, I didn't know any of that. So uh, you know, I, I I'm thankful, though, that my mom was able to find this out real quick because, to be honest with you, and I'm going to be honest with everybody who's listening, like, I think it was because of the fact that's the reason why I'm able to live a better lifestyle now. You know what I'm saying? Like, meaning, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not going to say throughout my times then it got drastically better. I was still dealing with a lot of stuff from the ages of 14 all the way to 18, still living with the past and, you know, uh, you know, like, still get into some trouble every so often. Uh, but, but to be honest with you, for the fact that I simply got out of it, that started helping things get better. Cool, man. And and, and Tony, sorry, you you mentioned something about friends and not having many friends. So like, did you have anyone that you sort of associated yourself with, um, that wasn't bullying you? And also like, are you still friends with any of these people today? Yeah, so it's so funny because uh, these two guys, uh, I guess one day when we talk again, because we talk sparingly, and there's one I talk to a lot more, uh, but uh, we had this uh, we had this little, I don't know, we, I guess we call ourselves a group. I don't know if we necessarily wanted to call ourselves a gang, but we call ourselves a group. It was called, uh, I forgot, but we had our names. My name, his name was Fox. <laughs> my, name was, my name was Moondog, and his name was Phoenix. I don't know. This is what 11, 12-year-olds, <laughs> we came up with his yeah. name. Fox, so, Moon yeah. Dog, and Phoenix, you know? I don't know, because we watch TV and watch the Power Rangers and Ninja Turtles, so we're just like, oh, let's call ourselves that. And uh, today, you know, now, you know, they went into the Marines. They went into the United States Marines, served in the military themselves. Okay. Um, I, I always knew that because my friend, the main one, the, the he was like uh, a year or two older than us. I think, yeah, because I think, what, I was t- 11 and 12, or 12, and he was about 13, 14. And he was like kind of the leader. We made him the leader, you know, by default because he was smarter, you know, a little more wiser than us. And uh, just I'm just I'm I'm just thinking about the these guys. And at that time, we wanted to go into the police force. We wanted to be FBI. We wanted to do Secret Service. And here we all are, all three of us. We all served in the United States military. We all served in the armed forces. Interesting. Wow. Very interesting, you know. Very interesting, so I try to keep talking with them. Yeah, I try. I, I and you know what? I need to talk to the the the, the leader, the former leader of the group, I, because it's been it's been quite. Fox. Yeah. yeah, Fox. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool, man! Isn't it cool? I like guys always give themselves nicknames growing up. Huh? <laughs> oh, classics. So, so Tony, um, you you touched there on like uh, serving in the uh, U.S. Army, but you know also just before that. Uh, you kind of started your your rap career, and you you started traveling the world. I think that that happened just before you you went to the army. Is that right? Yeah. So I mean, age fourteen, when you know, finally started settling in more into a new life. Uh, my you know, living with my mom and my stepdad. We moved up to Connecticut. Uh, they uh, I joined a rap group called the Verbal Assassins Click. I guess I'll say it out loud, you know. And once again, I think I said this before, but I'll say it again. And I'm and, and I think for me, it's more about transparency, as there is not only a therapeutic effect, but I really want to reach someone out there who is listening to me on this podcast today. I really want to touch that one person. You know, I really want that one person to really see that 
they too can transcend and break through the madness and the, and the issues that may have had in the past to make for for a better today and make for a better tomorrow. Awesome. So like, you know, so I hope my story touches someone today and I w- do believe it will touch someone today as my stories have always, you know, and I'm not trying to be too, I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I just noticed when I give my stories, there's one person and I, and I don't mean to, to, to sidetrack, but one kid, he messaged me on Instagram one day. He was really depressed, super, super depressed. And he was ghost following me on Instagram for a whole year, never messaged me. And then all of a sudden one day, I guess he, something happened. I guess he got slightly a little bit, little bit better because of all the books I promoted, all the talks I've given, you know, all that stuff, the, the, the rhyming, the rapping hip hop book reviews that I've given. And he messages me and he goes, dude, he goes, I've been watching you and I've been listening to your stuff for a whole year. And I really enjoy what you do, man. He goes, I wanted to kill myself. Like, sometime before that he goes i was really depressed my mom they get on me and all stuff like that my mom and dad they're always on me they make me really anxious really stressed out you know um i'm you know like girls girls in high school thought of him as unattractive like they're just like he's weird and he's creepy just because he's just so bogged with so much like you know just stress and anxiety and depression and he goes he goes dude your books you know all your stuff has helped me he goes but I'm wondering like if we could talk a little bit more and because because I was able to tell my story and so much with transparency being so vulnerable being so open and clear about who I am that one kid stopped himself from wanting to kill himself oh, that one kid man. like if you looked at his photos when I looked at his profile he looked hard. I'm sorry I don't, I don't I, I'm looking I looked at his photos when he finally when he messaged me around that time he looked bad he looked yeah. horrible then he got his new photos, and I'm talking to him. I talked to him on Skype and stuff like that. Just happier. He's he's now the editor in chief for his college newspaper. Like a lot oh, of great wow. things. Yeah, he has a gorgeous girlfriend. Like there's this girl he's dating. I'm just like wow. Like all these great things. Like before he, he was friendless. He had no girlfriend. Like girls thought he was cre- like creepy, weird, and, and unattractive. Uh, his parents were always on to him. He couldn't control his mind. He was so anxious. And now he's a lo- little bit more clear. Had a little bit more positive. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, he still needs some work, but nevertheless, the fact that I had my story and I was transparent, I'm making. I made that impact. And that's the reason why I want to continue telling my story because I know I'm making an impact, you know, for somebody's day, for somebody's life. Well done, buddy. Sure, yeah. It's you amazing. You stimulated man. something inside of him. Well done, man. Yeah. 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 So going back, guys, you're asking me about hip hop and rap and how it came about before I got into the military. At 14, I joined a rap group called the Verbal Assassins Click. My name was uh, Black Philly, also known as Black Philosophy. This was kind of like my <laughs> underground, like, Hip hop, alternative hip hop name, because at that time, and all the way, even all the way till almost recent times, I was in that kind of hip hop where it was all about like lyrics and you know, a, you know the the wordplay and and facts and science and mathematical equations and the suns and, and the moon and the stars and the earth, like all these like crazy cerebral shit. <laughs> you know, like that, that was where I was coming from. We were talking about this high vocabulary terms with rapping and that's, that's what we did. And, and we so give us some names there. Give us some, uh, give us some artists that were influencing you at the time. Oh, okay. At this time, whoo, at this time there was guys like Pharaoh Manch. He came from a group called the organized, uh, organized confusion. Busta Rhymes was definitely, mm. uh, very instrumental, but then there's other people too. That was very, uh, uh, influential to how I just had my like swagger to how I rapped on, whether on stage, live, at parties, or whatever. On It was Mob Deep, it was M.O.P., because they also uh, had the essence of what I came from prior to moving to Connecticut, which was from, you know, was the inner city struggles, hardship, yeah. you know, crime, murder, and all that stuff like that, and drugs and all that stuff like that. So I, like, attached to that a little bit with the swagger. So Mob Deep and M.O.P. were, like, two big ones for me. Notorious Big. You know, then it deviated into like Pharaoh Munch. And then as I was getting older, it got into like people like from the Rhyme Sayers click, like Atmosphere and Idea and Brother Ali. These are now these names right here are very like sub super, I mean, sub, sub, sub genre of like hip hop. Like they're very underground. Yeah, so they were very instrumental, you know. So I joined this group called the Verbal Assassins Click. There was five of us, uh, and we would rap at lip syncs. We rap our, our own little concerts. Even the lip syncs, we did our own music, you know. And uh, at about 17, 18 years old, MySpace came up. Yeah. And I was uploading my music to MySpace. 
uh, at that same time, 17, 18, another pivotal moment, I enlisted into the military. You know, my mother forced me at that time because I didn't want to go in. I was like, Mom, I don't want to do that. I want to go to college. I want to run track because I was running track, indoor, outdoor track, playing football. And um, my mom was like, no, you need to go in because your head is still, like, not, like, focused. Like, you're still, like, you know, the, my past was still, like, kind of, like, scraping, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. you're running away from the fire. Like, there, you could still feel the fire on your back. Like, the fire was still... <laughs> Like hitting my like I could feel the heat. The metaphor. The heat. You know, so I'm here, you know, obviously to the point that I had still the the pain and the anguish. You see how my body's just like ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> see it. <laughs> uh, classic. So, so you know, so she's like, you need to, in, you need, you need to enlist into the military. Uh, you know, when she goes, when I was a nurse. At that time, she was going to go into the Navy, but I guess at that time, the benefits weren't that good in the United States to go into the military. So she said, no, I'm comfortable with my you know, civilian job as a nurse. Like I tell you, my mom, jack of all trades, she did a whole bunch of things, which I respect, but you know, nevertheless, you know, here I am today thinking about how I got to focus and be focused on my core values and everything like that. And she had every military person come in, every military person. Uh, Marines, uh, United States Army regular, the, the active duty ones, and the reservists, and then uh, Navy. All of them came in, but the best one who had the best sales pitch, the one who was the, the best salesperson, was the United States Army reservist. Uh, I think his name was Sergeant Green. Uh, he was just real cool. The way he talked, he had the swagger. It, it was good enough that my mom was like, you should do it. And I, 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 I generally liked him too. So I was like, you know what, fine, I'll do it. Because my mom wanted me to do it. So I did it for the love for my mother, you know, and they did it just to, to make my mom happy. But nevertheless, I look back and I'm like, man, I'm so thankful. But at the time, at 17, I went into the military. I signed up. I did basic training. And even at that time. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you're next to an Navy base. <laughs> it's a ship that's going off. Let me just close. <laughs> let me just close my window. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's got his subwoofer going there and cranking it up. <laughs> okay, we're good. <laughs> well, we lost Sony. Yeah, <laughs> there he is. Classic. That's so funny. That's cool. Um, and yes, you know what? That that's great background music right there because I was talking about the Navy. <laughs> yeah, they, they heard you, man. They're like, burr, burr, yeah. Burr, burr. <laughs> Motley, like that's um, that reminds me of some of the shows out there where the the DJ or somebody puts some sound effects in every so often when the interviewee or the interviewer is yeah. talking. <laughs> that was the timing was perfect, guys. <laughs> so, well done. Yeah. Guys. <laughs> so while I was in the military, guys, I was rapping still. Like I was in the reservist, so I was still able to party in college, go to college, and I'm thinking about this party time. But like I'm writing, I'm rapping, I'm freestyling at parties. Everybody's like, "Yo, this this dude, he can rap so well." Now, guys, I'm basing at this time my level of talent and skill and abilities on what other people are saying because though I thought I was good, you know, like I wanted to also use, I wanted to create an impact and give value to others. That was my thing was how much value am I giving to others as well when I'm doing this? Like I could toot my own horn and be like, "I'm so dope, I'm so ill," because I knew it for myself. You know, I wrote my first rap when I was 13, and I was like, eh, like, it was like a, more like a poem than it was like a regular rap song. And then 14, I wrote the second one, and it just like transcend, like it just like, I, I just like blew the charts with my level of like rhyming on rhythm, you know, with my rhythm, with my flow, my wordplay, uh, just things like that at the age of 14. I'm just like, I, after, like, I did that one time, and then of course performing, and I just knew it, that this was my calling. Uh, but I was, I kept writing, I kept rapping in front of people, I kept freestyling, I kept doing some performances, even while I was in the military or even while I was in, in college, I just kept doing things, you know, I was performing in dorms and stuff like that, performing at, at college, and I'm just like, man, like, I'm, I'm continually doing this stuff, I'm, I'm enjoying it, and then one night, after, it was during like a really big beer keg party, I mean, it was awesome. <laughs> Gorgeous chicks around, man. I was fucking in my glory. I was about 18 years old, 19 years old. Beautiful chicks hugging me, kissing me, loving me. I felt so freaking good. You know, like I'm doing keg stands. We're all drunk and fucking crazy and all this, all this stuff like that. And then I get a call and I notice it's a call from my unit. 
I'm having the greatest time of my life. I'm living in this house with fucking eight other dudes. It was like the real world, except we all loved each other. Uh, <laughs> the real world MTV. Uh, but, you know, but so I get this call, and I'm just like, I don't want to answer this call. So I just put it back in my pocket. Then I get the call again, and I think he gives me a, a, a voicemail. So I go into my car, and I said, let me go and check what the hell this is about. And I knew around this time. This is the year 2002, around this time when uh, issues were happening overseas. And I was like, I knew something was going on, but I was like, all right, whatever, whatever, whatever. And they're saying rumors about us potentially doing something about it. And I go in my car, and the guy tells me, you know, my one of my sergeants, he says, look, he goes, uh, we have drill next weekend, like a typical drill that we have in the reservists where you go set Saturday and Sunday, and that's it. And he goes, so, you know, make sure you bring your, you know, you bring all your gear, you know, we're going to do our training. And then right before he gets off the phone, he goes, also, I just want to tell you, uh, we're going to be activated and mobilized hmm. to go oh, over wow. Kuwait, Iraq. Wow. And I seen wow. my car at the age of 19 when I heard that. And that kind of effed me up. Like, I sat in my car and, like, I just, like, sunk in my car thinking about my life. And I go, at that moment, I was just thinking about just, like, everything that was going on in my life. What is going on from here? What's my life wow. going to become? I was really scared and, and worried. And then I just try to, like, numb it by going back to the school. You know, to the uh, to the more awesome party that I was having, but uh, we went back. You know, you know, we, we went to um, in 2003. I think it was January or right before it, before January. We went to this place called Fort Drum, also known as Fort Icebox in New York. It was cold as hell. You could leave a can of soda outside for five minutes, and the thing will freeze up. And uh, we were getting trained because they were telling us, oh, you know, they said these rumors, oh, you guys are just going to go to Africa. You're going to go to Egypt and just hang out in Egypt. Don't worry. You guys are not going to go over there. You're just going to go to Egypt. You're going to go to Liberia. I don't even remember what the hell he said. To me, I'm 19 years old. I'm just whatever, just soaking it up, whatever, living with my parents at that time. But, of course, going to college as well. Uh, and Or at least I was going, I was living in the dorms, you know, but still, you know, living underneath my parents' yeah. dependence. And uh, we trained in New York, and then finally they said to us, look, we're going to Kuwait. Wow. And I, I, I won't lie, my mom, I, my mother never cried. My mother never cried in front of me, ever. My mother wow. never cried in front of me, ever. Jeez. But when did she cry? I told her, I called her yeah. up right before we we're all in gear. I'm in my helm, I'm in my Kevlar helmet, I'm in my khaki colored desert uh, uniform, my khaki colored yes, desert uh, US Army uh, camouflage uniform, my rifle, my M16 is over me, my 50 pound rugsack is on me, you know, heavy and all this, and it's freaking hot. I don't know where the hell we are, but it's sunny outside, nevertheless. And I call my mom and I go, Mom, we're going overseas. Hmm. And, and she, my mom was like, no, you're not. And I said, yes, we are. I said, As a matter of fact, do you hear that? Do you hear the planes going off? <laughs> my mother started crying. She, wow. I just never, my mom, yeah, she's like, no. She's like, oh, my God. You know, she was, yeah, yeah. I just never knew my mom was, like, would get huh. this crying and teary-eyed. So we go to, you know, Kuwait. We get there. Another thing. Oh, don't worry. You guys are just going to hang out in Kuwait. You know, we do our time there. We're, you know, I think I forgot what we're doing. I think we're just learning training and stuff like that. Then three months into it, about March, March of 2003, we're getting told we're going to Iraq. Hmm. And I'm just like, wow. And all the guys in my unit, they're fathers. They have children. They have jobs. They have real jobs. I'm this kid who goes in college and working at the Gap. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> You know, so to see that these parents, these people who are 25, 35, 50 years mm. old, having to hear this and having to leave their children, having yeah. to leave their kids and their families and their moms and their dads and their brothers and their sisters, you know, having to leave their little daughters who haven't even just been born, haven't even been born yet, haven't even left, you know, haven't even left their stomach. And more importantly, haven't even been able to see their kids take their first step. Because their wife had to call and be like, you just missed when Johnny walked over to me for the first time. They're missing all this, you mm -hmm. know? Go do something that they're unsure of, meaning that they don't know if they're going to come back home. Jeepers. Because the job that we had where we were bombs on wheels, a.k.a. we were truck drivers who hauled high-octane fuel for the uh, Air Force C-5 aircraft, and we're trudging this oil, this fuel, this gasoline, Crazy. Eight hours across the country. Eight hours across Iraq. Jeepers. So we're, we're prone to getting shot, uh, blown up, yeah. killed. 
Wow. But, but Tony, can I just ask you a question there quickly? Like, um, you know, you say that it's tough and you had to go and, and there were dads and, and what have you that had to go off and, and be left, leave their families. Isn't that a choice that you make? Most definitely. And that's that. And, and isn't that an interesting thing? So choice that you make now for them, some of them, most of them were just like, well, I had nothing going on in my life, so I joined the military. And I think about that. You know, some people, like, they have nothing what they want. You know, they don't know what they want to do. Perhaps, you know, there's always some reason. Maybe their mom or their dad are more likely they served in the Civil War or their grandparents or great-grandparents served in the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, whatever, World War One, World War Two, And they also want to live vicariously through that. Everybody has their reasons, but nevertheless, a lot of these people volunteered. Right. They mm. volunteered. And here's me. All right. I can make the excuse and say, well, I didn't want to go. My mom forced me and I was 17. So I guess at that time I could write. Well, it, it depends. Right. But rightfully so, I could say I was forced to go in the military. But mm. I thought about that. And of course, here I am today, more adult like and be like, you know, you could have because this is how hard I could be necessarily on this whole idea that. I could have easily said, Mom, no, I'm not doing this because I don't want to do this. Yeah, yeah, fair but, enough. No, so, yes, yeah, so there you go. So for me, it was a mixture of involuntary meets voluntary. Like, I could have easily said, Mom, I don't want to do this. But, you know, at the time, because it's my mom. and You listen I, to I, your they, mother, man. Yes, listen to your mom. <laughs> listen to what your mom says. I am the grown-up. You're still the child. You're a minor. I'm 17 years old. You know what I'm saying? I'm not necessarily the age of legal, like, you know, maturity or whatever they want to call it, being an adult. So, but it's the, here's the ironic thing here is, guys, that you could get a, you could get cigarettes, but you can't get alcohol at age 18. Yet you could be put on a ship or a plane to go overseas to go put a bullet to somebody's head. I still don't understand that. Yeah, it's junk. Mm -hmm. It's rubbish, eh, bud? Yes. Yeah. And I actually haven't really put that together, you know, like for Americans, yeah. of course, because 21 is like your drinking age and stuff, and then. <laughs> But you can go and you can go to the army and fight and kill people and obviously get killed yourself. It's scary, man. So, right. so yeah, just, I mean, how long did you actually serve for? In I, served for eight, I served for eight years in the reserves and I served in Iraq for nine years, uh, nine, months. nine months. Nine months in Iraq, eight years in the reserves. Wow. And, and, and was, what else like happened? Any, anything else like happened while you were serving those nine months in Iraq? Uh, so we got there. Oh, man. Um, the stories are it's very interesting, and I want to say very fortunate. But during these times, uh, our unit was rarely hit up with small arms fire. Other units in our battalion, like this whole, I wish I could use it in corporate terms. Like I'm thinking of McDonald's. <laughs> you know, McDonald's has McDonald's and all the, like there's a McDonald's in, I don't know. I wish I knew cities in, in the UK or cities. <laughs> or Perth, a McDonald's in Perth. And there's a McDonald's in, <laughs> see, I know Australia more. On the Gold so, Coast. So, and, uh... Yeah, there's a McDonald's in, in Tamworth. There's a McDonald's, you know, those are units. Those are units, Yeah. right? But then you get to a bigger, uh, I think, but then you comprise all those McDonald's in this one region, that's considered a battalion. So I don't know if you're familiar with the United States or maybe, I don't know, I'm trying to think of London. I'm trying to use like cities in like uh, UK, but like, yeah, okay. Right, man. Use the States, but for sure. Use the okay, because yeah. okay, I was thinking of UK, but and people who are from the UK, please bear with me as I've never been to the UK. <laughs> but like, states have McDonald's all set up in London, Wales, uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Scotland, right? You take all those, that composes of a, of a battalion. Okay. But then you start venturing out even more and you start going to Scotland, Ireland, uh, uh, London, a uh, couple, I forget what the other ones are, uh, Portugal, Spain. That the more, the more there is, it becomes a brigade. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, but I, I can't really split it up like that. Like, I would have to, like, say a little bit better um, el eloquently to you. But nevertheless, yes, one McDonald's would be a unit yeah it would be considered yeah, a you, company yeah. totally yeah, yeah that's what they call it in the, in the military a company it's a company i was in a company which was f comprised of four platoons anyways i don't want to break it down like that but nevertheless you know i don't want to com confuse anybody and derail off of this idea but uh at that time uh our company our unit was very fortunate we got hit up with small arms fire a couple times. Uh, we s saw a big mortar round or a mortar round that hit and made a huge mushroom cloud. Like, I forgot how many yards away. It was maybe like, I don't know, maybe 500 yards. It was far, but nevertheless, it was close. Like, it was so mm. big, but <sighs> yet so close. And um, the only real... Uh, so, 
One and, and and you know what? Out of those two times that we got hit up with small arms fire, because we function nowadays as if it was a, a job, you work your certain amount of days and then you have a day off. And coincidentally, and I thank the universe. That's why I'm here. And this is another reason why I'm thankful that I'm alive. And I keep saying I'm thankful. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. I'm alive. Because out of those times that we got hit up with small arms fire, that our trucks got riddled with bullets, there's bullets and fuel is pouring out of the tanks, wow. hmm. pouring out of the tanks, I was on my day off. Wow. They gave me a wow. day off. I was, Crazy. yeah, I was off, you know, hanging back on the thing. Uh, but nobody died, nobody got hurt, whatever. Other people in other units, other McDonald's, <laughs> other units, they were, uh, they got one killed him one got killed another person committed suicide because he saw how you know people were constantly messing with the, his unit was getting messed with a lot nobody died well, one person died but you know mess, majority of people were just getting like like messed messed with a lot mm. uh that after he saw people getting messed with and one of his people getting shot that he tried to attempt to jump out of of his moving truck which is about nice. yeah it's taller than me i'm five foot eleven almost six feet uh, and the trucks in the cab is about um, yeah about six seven feet. So he's trying to jump out of a cab, the cab of the taxi. I mean of the truck yeah. that's this high, while it's moving at eighty miles per hour. Jeez. So, and of course he didn't die. No. So you know this is another unit from a different area of our battalion. Uh, and but the one thing that we brought home with us, we had some females in our unit, and there was this one mission that we went on. We were heading up to uh, Baghdad International Airport, and she was in her truck. She was on the passenger seat. You know, we all are told to keep our rifles out because there's some of these cities you're going into, guys, and like the cities are so tight and so close. Like all the person has to do is go like this, <sighs> or "hachu," like you know, like they could literally sneeze on you, and like you could feel it. Like I don't know how we're driving through these cities, and like. People could literally, they could jump on top of our trucks. They could, hmm. they could, I mean, the way they're doing things, they could e easily like just kill, they could do something to just hurt us like really badly. Hmm. They could put us in a bad position, put Jeez. us in a bad position. And so we were on this one mission and we're driving and this girl, you know, is on the passenger seat and she is, you know, uh, there's this big haystack. So all you can see, say, let's pretend you're driving, you're driving and you're seeing in front of you a big haystack. It's like huge. It's a huge mound. I forget how many feet it is. A huge mound. And it's on a trailer being hauled by donkeys because they use donkeys to, to, mm. to transport their, um, their, their goods or whatever, their hay, the hay, food, whatever. She can't see what's in front of her, so she's like, okay, whatever. Nevertheless, you know, we haven't been hit, so she, she's not open to this whole thing. Like, you know, we could die. Maybe she is. I don't know because some people keep their minds open still. But I got to a point where I was just like, eh, we're cool, whatever. We're such a great unit. Nothing happens. I still keep doing my thing and I look and all that stuff. But I'm not on guard, you know. And it's mm. those during those times that you have to worry when you're out in those situations because bad things can could happen. So nevertheless, she gets around to this haystack, and as soon as she gets to this haystack, this child is waiting there with a brick hmm. right there and throws it at her, wow. and it hits her eye. Oh man. Messes up her eye. She goes for reconstructive surgery. She has to go for reconstructive surgery three times. Oh, three times. And finally, her eye is replaced at 95%. Now she has 95% vision in that eye. Wow. wow. So that was the brunt of our, our experience. I mean, like, you know, we had hit up with small arms fire. You know, some people reported of coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, you know, like, you know, there was a lot of stuff. It was hot out there, 140 degree weather. A girl got hit in the eye with, uh, with a brick and messed up her eye. Uh, but we nevertheless all came back home alive. Wow. Yeah, and that's hence why you're so thankful and grateful. So is it? Is that kind of the impetus of, of why you started sort of helping people uh, and, and got into the health, uh, mental health worker and, and as a therapist and social worker? Was that something that was brewing under the surface for you? Was it in your nature? And how did you get into transition into that whole world? Uh, you, you know, I loved psychology and I loved uh, the field of mental health um, uh, for quite some time. Even when I was 18 
and we were just training. I was always reading personal development books. I was always reading nonfiction books that, you know, by Freud. I was reading books by Freud and Jung and all those people. Like, I really was very fascinated about the mind, you know, the psyche, you know, the the brain and all that stuff like that. Um, so I was reading it even then. I think, I think my uh, my experiences from when I was younger, you know, to when I finally got into the military – like what was what set the foundation of me wanting to get to that point. But yes, I think the military was what further like like packed it down, the idea that I want to help people. Because, mm. you know, like even like seeing my parents divorce and seeing how kids are struggling, in, you know, in these schools and having to worry about getting killed or shot and how they can't concentrate in schools and how there's like, you know, like just just like there's a lot of just turmoil and conflict and chaos happening. You know, uh, I mean, it, it, it led me to think like, if we can tweak our mindsets, put ourselves in a different situation, feed our minds with more uh, helpful things, you know, positive things, uh, we can we can make for at least our better life. We could better our lives at least individually, and that's where mm. it needs to start. It needs to start from within first before we can go without. Before we can reach thousands and millions and billions of people, we have to start first from within. And many people need to see that concept. And it goes back to the same idea, guys, Gareth and Greg. It goes back to the same idea, Gareth and Greg, that many people, I think many people don't see this idea of, uh, of how simple this idea, this average, how average this or simple this idea can be that if you can simply focus on within, you can, you know, and if everyone could do that, if everyone could start to, instead of saying, well, it's because of this situation, it's because of that situation, it's because of this, and that's the reason why I can't do anything, this is what happens, then things can change. Like, you know what I'm saying? If we can stop blaming outside and more taking agency from within, things can change. And yeah, I think that could happen good. anywhere. It doesn't matter what, you know, we could easily be like that. But like I said, it's kind of a tough thing, but I believe I have the belief guys that that can change. It's just going to have to take some strategy and some planning on some under, uh, wonderful individuals. Mm -hmm. so so, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about your time, uh, like Craig said, uh, doing the social work. Um, we've actually just spoken to a guy uh, yesterday uh, that was part of the the care system in the UK, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was probably the most difficult story we've ever had to listen to because the guy was uh, sexually abused from an extremely well. He, no, he personally wasn't, but yeah. people that he knows were from like the age of three. Like it was literally a pedophile ring. What is the social like work scene like in America? Oof. I must speak frankly on this, guys. It bothers me a lot. It bothers me a lot in, in America. I don't know how it is anywhere else. But it's a cyclical, it's a it's this system that just works from the professional down to the client. And it's just first off, um, being in in the field, I had noticed everything's top down. Everything's top down. We listen to these laws and policies and, and all these things coming from people who are not in the crap of it. They're not in the shit of it. They're not in they're not working directly with what's going on. And they're trying to employ these these ideas, these methods, these whatever that are supposed to help people, but it's not. It's actually putting people in a worse situation. Mm -hmm. Um for the worker, I want to say, in the, the, just for the individual, he or she, and of course, I ask my questions to them, uh, kind of off the record, or you know, or at least to try to ask them these questions and survey, and just to get their ideas. A lot of workers are jaded; they're tired. They just want their paycheck now because they feel helpless. There's a learned helplessness within, just like that psychologist Martin Seligman said about learned helplessness. They feel. They're helpless. They're hopeless. They just don't feel that there's going to be any change. And they're just like, well, this is all I know. And I'm getting paid for it. So I'm just going to do whatever they say, even though I don't like it. Um, for the clinician and for the therapist in these hospitals, they uh, and also doctors as well, the MDs, uh, the psychiatrists, we've gotten to the point where we treat clients and patients as if they're products on an assembly line. There's no, there's no real relationship or rapport with these clients and patients. And of course, there could be a whole host of conversations, but 
uh, just just but just thinking it here that there's no rapport and there's no real positive relationships with these uh, patients where you see less of a recidivism less of them less aka less of them returning back into the hospitals uh because i mean we're, we're just putting bandages on these and these individuals we're putting bandages on these clients and patients we don't necessarily get to the heart of their of their issues we don't really necessarily help them with that more 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 the more important thing for them in the hospital is is stabilizing them on their medications and it's medications 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 it's it's pharmacology or psychopharmacology in the in the mental health psycho um, psychiatric realm but it's it's more importance placed on a pill versus uh importance placed on the on the individual and their inner workings like in the in, in and all that stuff like that and so staff you know we're we're, we're we're you know at least when i was working i was you know i and, and of course many other people we just adhere to this whole um rubric of how you're supposed to deal with a client which is very objective okay fine but it still doesn't get to a very core foundation of these individuals. Um, a lot of these patients are coming from uh, low income uh, uh, um, circumstances. You know, they're they're coming from underserved communities, so of course they don't get the best um, uh, a level of care. And on top of that, their um, their admission and their stay in the hospitals, as well as their discharging from the hospitals, is predicated on their insurance. So depending on what their insurance says, which majority of them is, you know, would say, you know, like we're only going to cover for this and we're only going to keep it for that. It's, 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 it's just, I mean, once again, like it's, it's crazy. Just like I'm listening to, to patients and how they're telling me like, look, like aunt, like Anthony, you know, they're like, aunt, like, they're like, look, you know, I, I, I really need to get, you know, X, Y, Z done, but I can't because now insurance is telling me that I need to leave the hospital uh, today, or, you know, they won't let me stay here for another few weeks. They won't let me stay here for another month. They're just pushing me out. Uh, you know, like I have to leave. But then the funny thing is they still will readmit them because they don't know they have some interesting kind of Mm. process, whatever, but they interestingly allow them to readmit, which I see that as recidivism. They just keep coming in and out and in and out. But we're not doing anything. I look at these clinicians and I go, do you ever talk to them like a little bit more like about what's going on? Mm-hmm. Well, we don't have we don't have time for that. We don't have time for that. I can only talk to them for like about five, 10 minutes and then I got to go. So gone is the whole idea of the whole talk therapy. And then the MEDs and, and the psychiatrist, if, if you have a patient who's talking to the psychiatrist, the, the you know, the patient would be like, look, and this is how I'm going to say it to you, but them, like if you if you were there, you would know, mm-hmm. like you'd feel it. It's like, you know, like freaking my son just died, you know, I'm out on the street, I lost my, I got laid off, I have no job, you know, like I can't afford this, you know, uh, I, I can't even get transportation to come here and it's costing me, but they're giving me a loan, but I can't even pay the loan and blah, 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 I'm dealing with this, whatever, or, I don't know, they're dealing with a whole host of issues and the psychiatrist is just going there with a paper and pen just going... Actually, they're not even doing that. They got to the point where they don't even use a, a notebook. They're just going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. okay, well, um, uh, I prescribed you XYZ medicine, and so uh, we'll just come back in a week and we'll check it out, okay? All right, take care. Like, it's just like, ah, oh, man. Yeah. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. Like, you know, like I'm saying, like, if you are in it, if you, if you were to be in this situation, you would see how unfair, unjust, how – you know, how inefficient, how, you know, just like all, it's just, it's just unfortunate. Wow. The patients have it. And, you know, you look at the staff too. Like I empathize with the staff too. Like the staff wish they could do something. They wish they could do They're something trying, yeah. better. And they always talk with each other. You know, I wish the hospital could do this. I wish they could do this. And they, you know, they should be doing this. And they're only, and they're arguing within each other. They're on this little level while these people up here are the ones who are the policy makers and the lawmakers and the rule makers and all that stuff. And they're just fighting with each other here. Oh, well, this because, well, you know what? Because blah, 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 blah. And they're fighting. I'm like, look, why are you guys fighting with each other? I was like, you know, like we need to have more of an active voice on this. Like we need to get more out there. We need to express our voice. And I know that there's, I know that there's, um, there's agencies and organizations and institutions out there. Like there's NAMI, which is called the National Alliance of Mental Illness. There's, I mean, this is a whole, all of them. But when I look at, when I'm looking at just even the hospitals that I worked in, when I hear from other staff, especially as I worked as an in-home therapist, I'm just seeing the same thing, the same reoccurring themes over and over again. And it's just like, I really feel like it's just putting the, the client, the patient in a bad position. 
Wow. Wow. Sounds like the system is certainly broken on some levels. Hey, jeez. Sounds pretty like scary. So, so you made your way. Sorry, but yeah, you go. Sorry, man. No, no. So, so you actually, because of these issues, you sort of made your way out of that and and moved on to to where you are now. Is that right? And and like, how was that transition for you? Was it was it a straightforward decision, or or was it um, quite tough for you to leave the industry? I, it, uh, there's a, a few uh, things that were going on at that time that allowed me to just cleanly break away from it and i really think that um i think it was due to the fact that <laughs> here we go we go we, and, and once again we're getting very deep into the core of who tony mosey aka anthony scott Palmozzi, is today um but um the the, the so so we're gonna re, we're gonna dive a little deeply into this and i want people to hear this but around that time again it was really interesting. I had a lot of friends and a lot of great things were going on when I got out of the military. I had a new job. You know, I was living on my own. I finally left my parents' house. Everything was really good. Um, but then I started seeing things starting to change around 2000, mm, 2013, 2014, uh, which is how the social climate was in that respective state I was in, like the, the state of Connecticut, uh, or at least in the county I was in. And a few other things were happening. Uh, I broke up with this girl who I was like in love with. Like I was obsessed, like almost deranged, crazily obsessed of this girl. And now I think about it, I'm like, why the fuck was I even thinking about this girl? But I was mm. obsessed with this girl and uh, she kept coming back into my life and she just kept fucking with me. She knew she, she, knew she had that. And like, you know, you know, here again, we're thinking about the reoccurring theme, of course, but I let that situation where I gave the agency and the control and I put it in her hands versus me putting the control and responsibility in my hands. And so I just let her like come back because I loved her so much that I was willing to do anything. I would drop everything in my life just to get back with this girl. Uh, and so we'd get back and we'd hang out for about a few months and then she'd just be like, sorry, you know, like goodbye. Like, you know, and I'm just like, whoa, like this sucks, you know? Um, and of course I'd just go fucking crazy over it. Like me and like, I'd be, back in depression and I was seeing a therapist at that time um I was uh I had a child at the age of 26 so this was when I was slowly getting out of the military uh when I finally was set and free in my um my life living on my own I met a girl at my job my then job at the time and uh we were hooking up and we only ho and we only like were fooling around for about maybe a month and then about yeah, for about a month. And then the next month later, we're hanging out and she tells me she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, holy shit, what the fuck? Like, you told me you weren't able to have a child. You know, you told me that you could not have a child. Like, what? Well, like, I don't want to have it with you, number one. Well, number one, I don't want a child, number one. Number two, I don't want to mm -hmm. have I don't want to have it with this girl. Because that girl and I, I'm just like, well, cool, whatever. Like, you're cool with whoever else. But I just knew that she wasn't a good fit for me. And so she tells me she's pregnant. And she tells me she's going to have the kid. And uh, mm -hmm. at that time, I didn't like it because I didn't want a child. Uh, now my child is now nine years old. She's nine. And I love my child. I'm thankful <laughs> for her now. I'm thankful. Yeah. At the time, I didn't want it because, you know what? Wrong person, wrong time, wrong part of my life. Wrong wrong time in my life here i am just starting to figure out just getting a brand new job and getting out of the military and figuring out all this stuff i was like i i, I you know i don't want a kid but you know uh push come to shove you know you think about this and the trials and tribulations i lived with my daughter's mother for three years trying to make it work out just did not work out we got into a lot of issues as well we were seeing a therapist together we went to couples therapy just did not work out her you know like her when you have mothers who are involved in your life like her mother was involved in her life so much that she would call three to four times a day always talking and i'm just like what are you doing why is she always calling you like can we just have her own and she'd have access with her keys she, her she gave her mom keys to our place and so she was a you know she came into the house you know quite often and i was like look your mom is just too much into our lives she's too much into our lives like you know like i'm not trying to be an a-hole i'm not trying to be this controlling guy i'm just saying can we just have some time around ourselves once in a while? But it just never worked out. And so I just knew it from the beginning. Like, we just weren't, 
we just weren't meant for each other. So fortunately, we broke off. I was still seeing my uh, counselor that I went to from the VA, uh, the Veterans Administration. He was mm-hmm. also a veteran himself. He served in the Navy, the Navy, and he was uh, a licensed clinical social worker. And uh, I went on trying to get into the uh, dating game again, and I got with this one girl who just, like, I don't know how it worked, but it, when she broke up with me, I was cool. But then the fact that I kept letting her come back in over and over again, like, it just kept breaking me down even more, and I just it just led into longer and deeper depression. And so I went to – so here's where it comes down to this whole Tony Mosey rhyming book review doing all this stuff where now I'm getting back into my passions or where I'm getting into something that's passionate. Um I was seeing this therapist and the therapist was telling me, he was like, look, he goes, he goes, I see how you are, you know, you're down, you know, and all that stuff like that. But every time you talk about this one thing, you're totally different. And that's Mm. hip hop. Every time you show me your music, every time you talk about, excuse me, a show that you're going to get on, every time you're going to go on a show, every time you're going to, you show me your music, every time you're doing this collaboration, you're going overseas to do this. Every time that's something that's due to hip hop, you look happier. You look more wider. Mm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like you're, you're just like you stand up more straight. More, you're taller. Your, your, your postures. You're like your back is out. Like, like you love it. Like the energy about you. Like the energy is because you're because this is what you love. This is your passion. Mm. Why, Anthony? Why don't you go back to that? And I just thought about that. And I was like, okay. So I read this book by Thich Nhat Hanh, guys. Uh, Gareth and Craig. It's called. You are here, discovering the magic of the present moment. It's a yellow book. Mm-hmm. It, to me, it looked like a huge, big, bright yellow book, but it was nevertheless mm-hmm. a yellow book that stood out. And this was given to me by a former coworker of mine. Uh, and she said, look, I see like you over here, you know, you're having your issues. Why don't you read this book? And I discovered then mindfulness and meditation and all that stuff like that and really, really appreciating the present, mo- present moment. So I visit my friends out in New- Norway to my rap friends, because I was making rap friends, you know, from 18 all the way till, uh, you know, 25, you know, traveling overseas because of MySpace. Like I said, because of MySpace and the fact that I was putting music up on MySpace, I was able to travel to uh, Australia, Norway, Argentina, Australia, and perform hip hop out there. But, and so I, I created my presence because of MySpace. But because of that, also, I made a wonderful family. And like, though they were, I, I want to consider them a rap family, they're more of just our actual family, like a regular family now. And uh, um, I, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry that I'm backtracking here. I'm thinking about the, the time when I was in, uh, it was my space and traveling around the world. Oh, so I go to Norway, guys, and um, I actually get into the, the to meditation, really. Like I start stopping and smelling the roses, like actually seeing a hmm. rose, smelling it, and hearing the sounds of the, the waters from the Norway, from Norway, the breeze and the... Hmm from the navy ships <laughs> and you know and I'm, I'm really stopping and smelling it and hearing it and sensing it and all that stuff like that and, and just amazing so i'm just like wow because of it got me back into wanting to read more and develop myself more and strengthen myself more so i started getting back into personal development and books and all that stuff like that and so i go on youtube and i'm looking at youtube and i'm like oh let me look for the next book because i want more books i want to read more books and i'm noticing how everybody's doing these book reviews in a certain way they're just all like you know this is what the book's about the book's like this and blah 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 blah. Stand like this just simply like you're looking at me like this is how it is on youtube they're just talk they're just talking to you and i just said to myself one day i said you know what this was in august of 2015 i said you know what i was like how about i put my own twist on it because i love books so much from when i was um, nine years old when i read 14 books in a summer book reading contest and playing an alto saxophone from when i was rapping when i was 14 years old to when i was rapping in the military and in and in, in, in college when i served also in uh, operations iraqi and enduring freedom in the military in the army i mean like i've loved hip-hop i've loved you know what i'm saying acting on stages and stuff like that public speaking i love all that stuff why don't I put my own little twist on it? So 2015 in August, I came up with the book, uh, the idea of being a rhyming book reviewer, which is trying to catch on to the trends of doing book reviews, but also trying to differentiate myself as well of the book reviewers, as well as not being hip hop anymore. Because at the, um, 
around those times too, when I got back from the military, I was still involving myself in the hip hop, but I was involving myself with the wrong kids, the kids that were fucking getting in trouble with the cops and getting arrested. And, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like they were just involved in some bull and uh, crap and they were taking drugs and, you know, they just, and here I am going for my bachelor's and my master's and I'm serving in the military and I'm doing all these things, traveling around the world. And, and I'm just opening my mind up to things while they're keeping their minds very closed. And so I'm just like, I need to break out of this. So here I am to this day calling, my, calling myself Tony Mosey, the rhyming book reviewer, because I am positioning myself where I am an edutainer, which is an educator and an entertainer for the love of, 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 of books, for the love of education, for the love of the fact that I've entertained on stages with music and theatrics and combining those two together. And so here's Tony Mosey. Buddy. Freaking awesome. Flipping yeah. awesome, man. You're a great storyteller, bud, and I'm I'm so glad that you are doing what you're doing and that you're doing it with such passion and energy. It's flipping cool mm. to see, man, and and just such a big smile on your face. Like it's <laughs> it's really it's sort of uh, yeah, infectious. It's contagious, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love sure. it. And, I love uh, it. So, bud, like, look, uh, we're coming to an end, unfortunately. So, what what uh, what's sort of in store for you? How can people get hold of you? Yeah. So, I mean, what, the last thing, my last word I want to say is, guys, uh, my one word, thanks to this guy I've been collaborating with on YouTube, his name is Evan Carmichael. He has 1.4 million subscribers. I always got to put that out there first. But he's uh, he's also always putting out videos and stuff that helps motivate you uh, through the world's most successful and, and uh, famous people. So, like, it could be anywhere from Richard Branson to Oprah to Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, uh, you know what I'm saying, to Elon Musk. He's always putting videos out there every day to help motivate you to let you see like that you know they've been through some crap you know they're just as average as you but they just do above average things and so I list his stuff like every day to help inspire me, uh, Evan Carmichael. But him and I have been collaborating a lot. We've been doing like I did a rhyming book review for him. Uh, we did a vlog. We did an interview together. And then now he's oh. featuring me also on his uh, his YouTube channel uh, as like, uh, you know, he's doing like a story on me, like a documentary on me, which is really cool. And I really thank Evan oh, Carmichael for doing this. But he wrote this book called the one, Your One Word, and his one word was belief, because he believes that everyone has Michael Jordan level abilities and whatever. So you can have Michael Jordan level abilities or Muhammad Ali or whoever's great, you know, as a public speaker, a teacher, a doctor, a business person, a you know what I'm saying, like a singer, a dancer. We all have untapped uh, level of talent, but we're just not realizing. We're not realizing that uh, or mm. actualizing that in ourselves. And I think after reading that book, the, your one word, I think my one word is passion. I really do believe passion is what makes the world go around. Passion is what makes me want to get out of bed earlier. Passion is what makes me not want to go to bed. Passion is what you can tell the difference between one or the other, who's passionate and who's not passionate. You can tell if you ask someone, um, um, when it comes to pens, um, you could ask somebody, what are your thoughts about pens? You can feel passion from the individual who's passionate about pens. I mean, I'm just using this as, as an example. It could be yeah. about cameras or traveling or um, food or, or, you know what I'm saying, or staying healthy and eating food. But you can see the passion in someone versus someone who has no passion. So passion, really, like, it's believable. People, people follow you more. They're motivated by people who are passionate. And so I believe my, num my one word is passion. Because passion, it comes from the heart. And that's why it's exemplified by this tie at this moment. This is my current branding that I've had for the past three years. The red tie is red for love, but it's also for passion because this is who I am. And I actually, I actually chose this outfit unconsciously. Like one day I just said, I want to be different. And I didn't even think about this. It was just very, I just did all this very unconsciously, subconsciously. And I just pulled all this together where I came up with these three colors, black, white, and red. And it makes sense because I do notice that I, I am passionate. I love hip hop. I love reading books. I love education. I love entertaining people. Like I have those passions. And I really believe that people need to realize their passions. Wow. Yeah. That's well, powerful, I mean, buddy. <laughs> that's powerful, man. Yeah. And then, like, no one would ever say for a moment that you're not incredibly passionate about what you do. So, so thank you so much for sharing that passion because it totally is like infectious and contagious and just inspiring, you know. So, so how can people get in touch with you and, and check out the work that you're doing? So uh, Tony Mosey is undergoing, uh, I don't want to say major, but I am going under different testing uh, uh, strategies and whatnot. Um, I, it, when it comes down to it, I'm rebranding. So uh, 
you're going to be seeing some different stuff. It's never less under the whole umbrella of edutainment because I do believe that this is where we're coming to. You can find me and my current stuff on TonyMosey.com. I'm everywhere else. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Tony underscore Mosey. Also, you can listen to my uh, podcast on Apple iTunes as the Tony Mosey podcast, as well as my YouTube channel at YouTube.com forward slash Tony Mosey. I would love to hear from you guys. If you guys want to send me an email as well or a message, send me send it to me on my TonyMosey.com website. Awesome, man. Awesome, buddy. Thanks so much, man. Um, I just want to say, first of all, what is the guy's name from uh, the Fresh Prince of Ballet that is Will Smith's brother? <laughs> you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> what's I, want, I want you to conclude it. I want you to, I want, but, I want to, I want to hear your response. But no, but what's his I, name I first? His his character name or yeah. his real name? No, his character name. Car- Carlton. 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 That's it. I'm like, Woo, I'm watching dance, you buddy. talk, man, this whole time. And I'm like, this is Carlton. This is Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> uh, classic. <laughs> and, and it's a... I knew, you know what? You're not the only one who says that, man. I've had that said to me uh, a couple other times in my life. That's classic. Because it's, I mean, it's your face, definitely, but, but also it's just, you know, when he does that flipping dance, that like silly dance, like I'm like, yeah, that's, that's the one. one. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing this since I was 14, guys. There we go, man. That, I used to wear a sweater over my uh, button-up shirt, and and people oh, like, oh, man. my God. Yeah, so. <laughs> you see, bud, you see. I knew it. So, anyway, bud, uh, like, yeah, anyway, it's, that, that's, I was, like, listening and watching you talk this whole time, going, it's Colton, it's Colton. <laughs> but I but on, on, on a more serious note, um, but I'm so flippin' happy that we did round two, you know, and it was such yeah. a great podcast, man. Firstly, the energy that you brought was just phenomenal, and it's such a breath of fresh air, but and it's it's what sure. people need Thank in life. And like you said, that passion is important, and people will gravitate towards it, you know. And and yeah. I certainly have for sure. And you just sort of made me upbeat. It's ten o'clock, and there's no chance I'm going to bed anytime soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> and your story is awesome, bud. Too, you know what I mean. Like you you are a proper storyteller, you know that's for sure. And you, you've gone through some very tough times, you know, and I think, I almost think like, you know, you, you don't, you don't maybe like uh, remember how tough it might have been, you know what I mean? Like it's, it, uh, I'm sure it was, you know, like it, it, it maybe doesn't sort of, um, I don't know, maybe there was like more sadness there, but because you're such a happy guy, you kind of almost like, it's not, it doesn't come out in the story, but still oh, you've gone through these, these tough times and um you've experienced so many things you know on in so many different like fields you know like uh music and obviously you know in the army and then um in the social care it's like you've really lived this sort of rounded life and you have a lot of experience to draw on and i'm just super excited for you like you know going forward because you have so much to offer you know you have so much experience and it's flipping the people that you're going to touch and influence, not just that guy who was like ghost following you, but many, yeah. many more in the future is going to yeah. be plenty. You know what I mean? So thank you, bud. And uh, that was a, that was a really awesome chat and uh, you're a great guy and uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you guys. Guys, I have, to, I'm sorry guys. And I don't want, I, I know we, we all have to get off, but I have three things to say to you. Number one, you, you, Besides Evan, who just recently came into my world about a week or two ago when he came from Toronto, Canada, down to Boston, uh, he came to me and said, like, he said some stuff to me that really impacted me, which is the reason why, like, besides the many people I've listened to, it was him that finally, like, put it there that said, I need to change my, my brand because I'm focusing so small and I'm untapping into the potentials that I really have. And because of you guys, Gareth and Craig, because of both of you guys, I didn't. You just said something just now that just tapped into my 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 uh, light bulb here. Because I didn't see that before, until now. Like I knew it was happening. Like a lot of people go, "Whoa, you have a lot of experiences. Whoa, this is amazing. Whoa, whoa, whoa." But 
and and I knew recently that I knew like the one thing I want to do is not just necessarily get paid, but also bring value to people by speaking about myself. That's what I want. I don't care. I mean, people talk about the law of attraction. I've seen so many people who just said, I'm going to do this. And they got whatever they wanted. No matter. There's a rapper who like, who's a rapping chef and he gets fucking like millions of followers Mm -hmm. and he gets paid off of this stuff. And he's on great, like, you know, TV shows. And so I'm just thinking about this. Like you guys just realized something that has been like very dormant in my mind. And that's to basically explain, just like you and what Evan Carmichael, this guy who has 1.4 million subscribers said, is to express my truth because more people are going to be touched by that. And, I, and, I, and I've been missing out. And because of you guys today, you just reminded me and that just sparked an interest to be like, you know what? I should go out into the community, go out into the world more and express my truth Definitely. because really, totally. like, you know, that's the value I'm giving to people. Totally, buddy. Yeah, man. Just, just briefly from my side as well, they're like, what you, exactly what you just said there, Tony, is like, when you know, last time we didn't actually get into your daughter and um, and you know that the hard times and the reality of what life is like sometimes, and that that's the stuff that a lot of people go through. And and just thank you so much for being so open and honest and raw about that because that really touched me, you know. And like and and obviously now you've got a, a beautiful daughter who you love, and but it was obviously I mean really tough for you as well. And and that that's exactly that depth that. And the rawness and that um, just laying yourself bare, that's the stuff that, you know, people will just totally gravitate towards. And I, I certainly like, you know, touched me and I'm sure Gareth as well, like just hearing these, that story of you. So please, like, just keep that up and do more of that because you have got that incredible story and people will totally, it, it, it will go from one person, even that's that's the one that counts, is that individual that, that, that sees you and, and changes. But Obviously, that'll that'll just go from one to ten to a hundred, you know. So, so keep up the good work, and and just thanks again for today, man. Really appreciate it. That's awesome. Guys. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll.